He was known as Terence Trent Darby at the time that he recorded that song. But shortly after, he had an epiphany, a personal epiphany, and he changed his name to Sananda Maitreya. And this is called uh, As Yet Untitled. This is from his 1987 album, Introducing the Hardline, according to Terence Trent Darby. This is Lead Stories. I'm Eutrice Lead, and we return as we get close to the end of our special presentation with Dr. Jeffrey Perry on Hubert Henry Harrison. <laughs> Jeff, you sound like you, you're moving furniture back there. Uh, just a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm getting well, pumped. <laughs> uh, okay. Things are going on, as you can tell, in Washington, D.C., but that's not our focus today at all. Today and tomorrow, we're wrapping up this special presentation by Jeffrey Perry on Hubert Harrison, and that is far more meaningful, far more meaningful than what's going on in Washington, D.C. We will get to that uh, after it turns out the way we've already predicted. Okay. But today we return to Hubert Henry Harrison. It is part three of the four-part series today, a special for Black History Month. Uh, Jeffrey, I wondered if we can if you can paraphrase for us or uh, summarize for us what in whole is the significance of this man uh, and his life at the time that he lived, of course, and what should we appreciate most about him? Okay, well, he... um... He is an extraordinary radical activist. He is a class radical and a race radical, and he's an internationalist. He had a profound effect on uh, the people of his era, and he had a profound effect on major figures in black history who uh, would affect many others, most notably amongst the class radicals, A. Philip Randolph, amongst the class radicals, um, Marcus Garvey. But he's not simply a radical. He is so multidimensional. He is a brilliant writer, orator, editor, uh, book reviewer, and he. this is all encompassed in one individual who only lives to be 44. So he really fully earns the title that was uh, ascribed to him, the father of Harlem radicalism. Um, And uh, I think I got a quote right handy if I can, but uh, let's see. Uh, Yeah, let me see if I got one here. Uh, Because I like to back this stuff up a little sometimes. But uh, uh, I'll find it in a second. (laughs) But uh, all his, not all, but many of his contemporaries recognized that, you know, recognized his signal influence. Um, He also lived, what's important is he lived with and amongst his people, not on the fringes of their social life. So Hodge Kiernan, for instance, writes uh, on The Voice and on The Voice's paper and on Harrison, it really crystallized the radicalism of the new Negro in New York. It exerted a tremendous influence in inspiring the people with the highest racial ideals and aspirations and inculcated in every Negro a sense of race pride and determination that was without parallel in the history of the race. Harrison, who lived on the most densely populated block in Harlem, lived with and amongst his people, not on the fringes of their social life, 
and he taught the masses and drew much inspiration from them. Kiernan goes on, Harrison was the first Negro whose radicalism was comprehensive enough to include racialism, politics, theological criticism, sociology, and education in a thoroughgoing and scientific manner. One other thing, as I was thinking, I, I listened to yesterday's, uh, although I couldn't be with you yesterday, I listened to yesterday's program and I got thinking a little more. And one thing, there's a number of things I want to stress, um, but Harrison uh, is just, he's so much a man of the people. And this is one area where he differs from those leaders who came before him, and he specifies what, how he is different in another way, a major way, is unlike uh, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, who wanted to unite the Negro masses from above, if you will, he said, no, the key to uniting the Negro masses is from the bottom, from the bottom up because these are the people who tr truly will stand by and put forth the demands of the race, something along those lines. So it, it, it's unity from the bottom up, a very stark contrast from the way leadership was approached prior uh, to his emerging, emerging on the scene. Sorry if that was too long-winded. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, some would say, okay, um, it's great that he was uh, such a, a luminary, such a, an exceptional figure, but uh, that was then. Um, of what relevance is it now? Very good. Very good question. Um, just have something, uh, and I'll tell you what I think is very relevant, uh, some things that he said and practiced all the time. Uh just getting here, because I tried to pull together some notes. Uh, Harrison believed that the opposition to white supremacy was the key to class unity in this country. He thought the principal enemy of the darker peoples was capitalist imperialism, that structures of racial self-protection were defensive measures in response to racial solidarity, that the task of white revolutionist was to show their sincerity by first breaking down the exclusion walls of the white working men before they ask us to de demolish our own defensive structure of racial self-protection. And he emphasized that black race consciousness arose as a consequence of the former and the cause should not be removed before the consequence can fairly be expected to disappear. So that's one key thing. He's constantly emphasizing the struggle against white supremacy as key to efforts at social change. And In the context of a class struggle. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, in the context of a class struggle, you know, I mean, he, he, he would love to have everybody, but his strategy basically, as he elaborates, and I have some quotes here if you want, his strategy after, and this is what's covered a lot in volume two, but after he breaks from the socialists and turns to concentrated work in the black community, his object is to try and unite and organize uh, the Afri African-American peoples, black peoples, um, from the bottom up and to do that with race, conscious, race, race consciousness, racial solidarity, and internationalism focuses first on African Americans, but then he wants to extend it to all peoples of color. He puts out calls for a colored international, um, and he wants to do all this to challenge white supremacy, both domestically and internationally, and he thinks that's the key to, to social change in the world. Um, so that's just taking it one step further. Does that formula still hold? Is it still applicable today? That formula of the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy, I certainly think yeah. it does. And I, I base that um, in part on my many, many years of reading uh, histories of the left and labor and race issues, because um, that's how I started. I, I came to Harrison. I didn't set out to write about Harrison, but um, white supremacy undermined um, the three major P 
periods in U.S. history, Civil War, Reconstruction, uh, the 1930s, and uh, the and earlier than that, of course, uh, the Reconstruction, post-Reconstruction period, when people at the bottom of society began to come together, and then those efforts were beat back by white supremacy. It's a lesson I think it's important to learn, but I found from firsthand um, practical experience, and this is coming out of a 4,000-worker postal facility in Jersey City where I worked for many years, and we started from scratch, so to speak, and how were we going to build a movement that, that we thought would move things forward, be progressive? And what was done was, you know, after discussion and assessment, we decided that we were going to put the struggle against white supremacy as central in the context of our daily struggles against the bosses and against the postal service and against overall capitalist society. And we did that with some, you know, some serious uh, indications of success. Uh, of course, later on, things happened and, you know, things changed a little. But I, it, I saw firsthand how it was possible to make gains in that way. And that's why um, even today, I, I think I may have mentioned this before, I'm bothered when I see organizations on the left who list their laundry list of what they stand for and what their programmatic aims are, and they put the struggle against white supremacy down as number seven or eight, something like that. It's got to be central. It's got to be the key point. And I think all issues should be looked at in terms of, you know, how is white supremacy shaping them, how does it affect them, and how can we take it on? And and it's a it's a a very important area for how to have people come together and discuss. And similarly, uh, you know, of course, I think, and Harrison thought, that capitalism was a primary problem behind all this. And uh, so it's in that context. Some people would say, <laughs> excuse me, that what you just outlined and, and what Harrison uh, began to outline is itself a racist concept. So how could you fight white supremacy with black supremacy? Well, he's using, when he uses race consciousness, as I, in the quote I read earlier, when he develops the new Negro movement, he's developing it in response to white supremacy as a defensive measure. He goes, if they're not going to work with us and they're going to pose obstacles all the way, we have to protect ourselves and we have to build this unity and then struggle to push the, the, the uh, struggle ahead. So uh, Harrison was, in my opinion, very far from racist. He was an internationalist, and I try and stress that. But he would not, he would not tolerate uh, white supremacy. He would speak out against it. And that, you know, made him... Uh, you know, a uh, uh, target of attacks from many sides. But Harrison was an internationalist, um, but he understood the importance of racial unity and international racial unity and international colored unity. And uh, so he and uh, but he he did not hold any. You know, he did he didn't defend the white race at all as. The other person I write about, Alan, did not. You know, he, 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 neither one of them saw anything positive in white identity. You know, they got to got to break from that. Start acting human. Oppose white supremacy. You know, uh, it's kind of the, the the general mo you know theme that one can find there. We're talking with Dr. Jeff Perry. I know you kind of wince when I say doctor. <laughs> I just, you'd say, I'm just Jeff Perry. Uh, but uh, it is an acknowledgement of the work that you consistently have done over these many years. But this two volume work is spectacular uh, and awe inspiring. And it, it demonstrates the investment you made in doing the research and compiling the information and basically giving... Woo! What are you doing to me there? 
<laughs> Excuse me. I, I'm just getting ready for my next batch of offerings. Go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I just wanted to to say that this two-book work comprising 1,588 pages together uh, is a great place to start. Uh, not only for those who haven't delved deeply into uh, the, the, the works, we, we, we think we know what people have said, but we haven't read. And this is very, very important. This is ammunition to give you uh, a firm rooting in what is being discussed. And it, you couldn't get it any more authoritative than from Hubert Harrison, who lived it. Uh, so I'm encouraging you as a gift to yourself or to your family or to someone you care about, get yourself these two books and start, officially start your library. Uh, and you would start it with the focus on thinking. You know, the, what was it that informed people's ideas? How did they get to think what they were thinking? And Harrison is a perfect example of someone who lays it out. You don't have to guess. He lays it out. He explains how he came to think what he was thinking. Uh, and you would find an enormous uh, parallel here because in this day and age, that's what we, we suffer from. We suffer from a lack of thinking, a lack of thought, a lack of uh, we don't have the architecture that helps us make sense of what we think. We, we can't explain what we think uh, as authoritatively as Harrison does. So we'll take your questions today at 888-874-4888, 874 Make sure you have a question, please, uh, not, not a polemic. And uh, we would want Jeffrey Perry. What I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I'm hearing all these different Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what that is myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, a, an email. You get an email. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Uh, but uh, this I is have life. To go. Do you have any callers? Because I have a couple of quotes that might spark some interest, too, if that's good. Okay. They'll be coming in at 888-874-4888. What has Jeffrey Perry explained so far that caught your attention and is motivating you to learn more about Hubert Harrison? You could share that with us so that we have an, uh, a working uh, a working example of how people's thoughts influence other people's actions. So that would be good to know if you have such a an explanation to offer us today. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Okay, um, I, I have a number of these things at points we can use to just be, uh, food for thought. But Harrison, as I said, was the first regular black book reviewer in Negro newspaper. And he took it as, as a very serious uh, task. And he writes on how to review books. In the first place, remember that a book review you are writing for a public who want to know whether it is worth their while to read the book about which you are writing. They are primarily interested more in what the author sets himself to do and how he does it than in your own private loves and hates. In the next place, respect yourself and your office so much that you will not complacently pass and praise drivel and rubbish. Grant that you don't know everything. You still must steer true to the lights of your knowledge. Give honest service. Only so will your opinion come to have weight with your readers. 
Remember, too, that you cannot well review a book on African history, for instance, if that is the only work on the subject that you have read. Therefore, read widely and be well informed at the widest spaces of knowledge for your judgment and back your judgment to the limit. That, that's an indication of his intellectual integrity. I have a 10-second anecdote, but a very prominent historian. I remember writing to him after he did a review of some other prominent historian of a book that didn't have a single footnote. And I dropped him a little note and I said, hey, did you notice that book you gave such high praise to didn't have a single footnote? And the response came back, ah, he was a friend of mine. If you would have asked me to write a re uh, review, I would have done it too. And I just shook when I read that, you know, because that wasn't the way Harrison would approach it. So, <laughs> Nathaniel from Southern California, you're on the air. Yes, hi. Good morning to you both and PRN audience. Thank, thank you. Good morning to you. Okay, yes, thank you. Here. My question is... I don't know if it's related to the book outline that is being given, but I'll, I'll put it out there anyway. Do you guys think that the white race of people think that black people want to over, overtake them and be supremacy like them? Is that why they're so afraid of integrating with black people. Jeff? Well, um, uh, first off... Does that question make uh, sense? Well, I understand it, yes. Um, and that's certainly what uh, I think we're taught a lot in this society, you know? And I think we're taught to lump all, quote, white people together. But I think the ruling class pushes that, you know, because it serves their interest. It keeps people divided. Uh, if you get a chance, if you go to my webpage, www.jeffreybperry.net, I have a tremendous amount on the history of the invention of the white race going back to 17th century Virginia and how this uh, has, was created and maintained by the ruling class uh, to serve their interest to, for social control. So um, I think it's important. What I try and do in my work is I try and challenge a lot of the beliefs uh, that people either hold or they're taught to, to hold about um, who white people are, you know, what white people think and stuff. I challenge essentially a lot what, quote, white people um, are told, uh, you know, what we're told white people think and, and how many of them do think. But we have to challenge it, and I try and challenge it a lot with historic uh, writings, with videos, with my political work, and a lot with just individual conversations with people. If, if we learn the facts and we can talk knowledgeably on some of this stuff, we can help, you know, break these barriers down, just whether it's walking in the park or walking in town, you know, or somebody you see every day you pass on the street, you know, if you get to, or if you're a worker and it's in the lunchroom and you get the breaks every now and then, you can go sit at the table with a friend, you get talking and you can start discussing this stuff and challenging it. Um, because a lot of what, quote, white people think is just what, you know, they, I mean, they get fed on the media, they're told this. And uh, they, if you push uh, a little bit, you, they really can't back it up very well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, good. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Nathaniel? Yes, it does. I was watching a program last night, a documentary about that thing that happened at the Capitol and why some of these, these uh, supremacist groups were involved and so on and so forth. And that one of the things that occurred to me is that why do they think that they're superior? Where does that idea come from? But we're, we're all human beings. It's just, it's kind of like, I don't know, I just don't understand why, they, why people with a certain skin color think that they're superior. But I understand that the information that is available to us that comes from the website, you know, touches on that. So I was just wondering if there was something that could be said 
in capsule form as to in answer the question. Form, if you go if you go to that website when, after Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, when U- European Americans and African Americans fought together, demanding their freedom from bondage, they were chattel bond servants. Both both groups, um, the ruling class sets up. They, they, that's when they invent yes. the white race, and they they do yes. it by extending privileges to European Americans and start telling them that they're white because they, the word white yes. didn't even come into existence in Virginia until 1691, according to Allen. So they would Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel, for your question and for getting us started on this section uh, today. Steve from New York, you're on the air. Good afternoon, Ms. Lead, and also Dr. Perry, as well as the PNC audience, PRN audience. My Thank question you. to you um, is in regards to what you mentioned earlier in your presentation a few days ago. You said that... Um, you but Harrison supported the birth control movement, didn't you? Hello? Yes. Yes, I did. But not I lost the you genocidal for a minute. aspects of Hello? it. Not the genocidal aspects of it. He spoke against that. But he, he supported women's rights in a sense of you know, birth control. And that's discussed in volume one. I have a very bad connection. I didn't hear what you said. Anyway, um uh, oh. In, uh, in terms, okay, I like to, since he supported the birth control movement, was he influenced by Margaret Sangster, who established the first public um, birth control clinic in 1916, which eventually led to the Planned Parenthood um, organization? Well, he was in the he was in the Socialist Party. I think Sanger came out of the Socialist Party, um, but he didn't take it in the directions she wound up taking it. Right. That's what I that's what I was trying to the point I was trying to make. He supported birth control, uh, a woman's right, you know, to, to access birth control. But he was very wary of genocidal aspects of that movement. As for and he talked about what was going on in hospitals in Harlem, and he was very critical of that, you know, where it was there were maybe efforts to uh, prevent black women from having children, things like that. And that's in volume one that's discussed. Okay. So no, no direct um, correspondence with Margaret Sangster. No, no. They they were in the Socialist Party. They might've been in the same branch five for a while. I don't have any correspondence between the two. And uh, they were also both in the free thought movement as were a number of free thought is thought unfettered by religion. And in my books, I list a number of prominent European Americans but also very significantly a number of very prominent African-Americans who people might not realize were influenced by um, free thought. Uh, And let me see if I can get that list real quick. Uh, uh, Well, but amongst those who are uh, African-Americans is Cyril Briggs, uh, Richard B. Moore, Hodge Kiernan, um, and very interestingly, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who his uh, biographer, David Levering Lewis, not in the two-volume biography, but elsewhere, refers to, uh, I, if I find the exact quote, it would be best, but points out that, um, let me see, as, uh, that uh, Du Bois was an agnostic and an anti-clerical, Right. I, I thought we, listeners might find that of interest because it's not something you associate with Du Bois, but that's coming from David Levering Lewis. Okay. I have just one more brief question. I purchased the hardcover edition of Volume 1 several years ago, and I was a little bit disappointed that it didn't come with that illustrious cover jacket with um, Uber Harrison sitting down with his arm folded across. Could you explain that picture and what's the whole meaning behind uh, it? Uh, yeah, the picture on Volume 1 is Hubert Harris, and the picture's inside Volume 1, so you'll find the picture inside. And it's Hubert Harrison at the Liberty Congress in late June, early July, 1918. The Liberty Congress was a, a, a grouping of over 100 people from 35 states, men and women, uh, who came together to put forth demands for enforcement of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment and an end to federal lynching, lynching legislation. And I write to either Harrison's left or right, let me go get my copy, is sitting 
William Monroe Trotter. Could you hear that? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 but you see, even with that picture that you can see on the screen, Harrison's pretty serious, right? He's got his hands crossed, his yes. arms crossed. And, but the picture is inside that volume. So if you have the volume, you get the complete picture. And the second volume has a picture of Harrison uh, uh, sitting at a table and turning around for a photo. And that's a photo of Harrison teaching a course on 135th Street on world problems of race in 1926. And you have over 70 of Harlem's leading activists. And directly in front of him is um, W. Uh, a. Domingo. Over to the left is Richard B. Moore in a picture inside the book. You have uh, Williana Jones Burroughs, Hermie Weisswood. You have a number of, I haven't been able to identify all the activists, but I, I thought these um, photos were particularly good because they showed Harrison with others trying to push the struggle forward, you know? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your call. David from Brooklyn, you're on the air. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Brother Perry. Um, David. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, going through uh, Harrison's works, did he have any prescription that would be good for today and how to reach those uh, white w uh, masses who are under the spell of uh, this concept of white supremacy did he have a prescription for how to reach these people and get by all the propaganda and training that the ruling class gives them to buy into this concept of white supremacy and white superiority and whatnot? Did he have a prescription that would be good today? Uh, that's the first part of my question. I wonder what you think about that. Well, he did. When he was with the Socialist Party in particular, he laid out some key, uh, key points. He, he understood that uh, racism was not innate. He understood that, using the phrase of the day, racism, right, that racism uh, was not in the interest of working class European Americans. What was in their interest was unity with African Americans. And he understood that the, that white supremacy was the key to how the ruling class maintained social control in this country. The real key, because they use that's what they use in those three periods I mentioned before those three crises, and we see aspects of it today again. They, they rely on on white supremacy, but that's the issue we have to take them on. On we have to beat them. So in order to do that. I think it's important to understand uh, what, how white supremacy came to be in this country, uh, how it's been implemented, maintained, and utilized, how people can have successfully come together, how there have been stumbling blocks in coming together. We've got to learn that history. And that's why my work, although I've done 40 years on uh, Hubert Harrison, I've probably also done 40 years on Theodore W. Allen who wrote The Invention of the White Race, two volumes also, which I edited and put out for Verso Books. And his, um, his, uh, also he pioneered class struggle-based white skin privilege analysis. And that was done in 1965, many years before Peggy McIntosh and the Invisible Knapsack and all this stuff that got in vogue in the 80s, you know, but doesn't really talk about class very much at all. And so I, I think both those, as, you know, those, those works and those people I've worked on offer lots of insights. I want to also point re, uh, listeners to my webpage, again, on the top left of my homepage is an article entitled The Developing Conjuncture and some insights from Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen on the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. And this article, for background, it starts out as a 2,500-word article for a journal called Daedalus, 
which is the American Academy of Arts and Science. I was shocked that they asked me to write something. This is back in 1909 after I came out with the first volume. Um, but that, art, that article, which runs 112 pages and then has a five-page addendum, really lays out how the works of both Harrison and Allen, you know, point the way forward. They also point out how things are not what we're often told. They talk about the great, how we're not doing so well in this country, you know, with the health care being so bad, the, the wage, you know, I, I, I cite statistics from a decade ago, but they're still very relevant today. So I think people could get much out of it. It's, it's probably the fullest treatment of the development of Allen's thought, because Allen spends 40 or 50 years on white supremacy. Also, um, yesterday, I believe it was yesterday when I wasn't here, but I listened to the, the audio, or maybe two days ago, one of the readers brought up Lerone Bennett, whose work Allen liked very much, and who I like very much. And um, uh, Bennett gets cited at, at points in that long article I do, and uh, Bennett had some very important insights, both on the 17th century and uh, later on, uh, he, um, he writes, again, very knowledgeably on Lincoln. And uh, I say that because in volume two, Harrison spends four or five issues of the Negro world writing a series on Lincoln versus Liberty. And it's a profound look at Lincoln, things that people don't know that Lincoln said. And uh, he wasn't all that he was later put up to be in terms of his thoughts. Harrison said he was a good man, you know, a great man, but he had his limitations. And, he, and Harrison was saying that in part because he didn't want the, quote, Negro people tied to the Republican Party. There was that famous quote about the Republican Party is the ship, all else is the sea, you know. And Harrison, so Harrison wrote a, a, a critique and a comparison at times between Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. A very insightful stuff. And I say that because about 10 or 15 years ago, Lerone Bennett came out with an article uh, with many similar insights on Lincoln. And about a decade ago or five years ago, Eric Foner, a very prominent historian, did too. But I know Foner because he was on my orals committee, and I spoke with um, Lerone Bennett. But neither one of them, when they were writing their work, was familiar with Alan's work. So, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, David, do you have a part two that you said you wanted to ask? Okay, he's gone. Ali, from New York. David will be back. David will be back. All right. Ali, you're on the air. Hi, you, Trace, and, hi, and, and hello to Dr. Uh, Barry. Um, yes, um, I have a, a question, but I also wanted to make a comment because this is um, from your first talk this week. I could just relate to something that you have said, um, Dr. Perry. Um, you see, when you come from the Caribbean, and as you can tell by my accent, um, I uh, am a what you call in this country <laughs> a light Latino, you know, um, mm -hmm. because you're talking about Harrison, how he was a dark skin, and when he came into this country, he realized, uh, he thought that he was a, an equal. And and then when you come from, uh, especially from the Caribbean, you think that you are an equal. And that happened to me. Um, so I ended up um, over 30 years ago marrying a Caucasian man, and we still marry. And he always had been done uh, really surprised the way that I behave and I act. And I always tell him, I say, I didn't born in this country. I didn't go through um, what African-American people have gone through. So I don't feel, I don't, I don't feel the same way. So therefore, I always think that I, I'm an equal. <laughs> and, and it hasn't gone away. Even I'm getting older and I still feel this way. So because he has been surprised that um, when I met the family, his family, and, and I, that's one of the things that I think, I don't know if they like me or not, and I really never care about it. Um, I always felt, and I still do, that I'm an equal to anybody. I don't care the color of the skin, even if they, they show racism and discriminate against me. 
So I was very surprised, and I just, when I heard you said that, I was so, like, I said, now, finally, I heard somebody saying what I was looking for all these years. So I just wanted to put that out there. But my question is, when you talk about him, um, you talk about a man who had integrity, ethics, morals, and, I mean, you could just go on and on and on. But one of the things that you emphasize is that he died poor, and with all this work that he wrote and all these things that he did, did he ever make any kind of money? Because you said that he refused $10,000 back then at that time, and I could imagine how much that $10,000 was at that time. So we have a lot of charlatans, a lot of uh, uh, black men in this country, and one of them is Al Sharpton, rep- so-called, unquote, represented the black community. Who can you um, pick um, right now that you will think it would be almost somebody equal to, to Harrison? Because I have been thinking about maybe uh, uh, Reverend Barber, but, I, you know, it's such a, I mean, when you talk about him, it's so much information and, and so much uh, that you said about him that it sounds good. But I would like to know if he ever made money and how he was able to survive and make copies and write all these things and all that, how he was able to survive. Thank you. Um, wow, these are a, a wonderful few things I'd like to respond to, and I'm going to do it quickly. I appreciate your comments on your background and, and what you say. I want to just add to that. Um, Alan wrote a fascinating article, which I have on my webpage, on the census, and they talk about how um, uh, and this goes back a, now. Several. Second, just a second. Um, is yeah. there somebody who has something on, like the television or radio? Not here. No, I maybe I stepped back too far. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Is this any better? You, but I'm still hearing uh, something else being transmitted. Uh, Not by me. Not, okay. Okay. All right. Continue, please. Okay, first, I just wanted to point out on the census, there's a very good article on my webpage by Alan. It's on the census, and it points out that going back several decades now, when the U.S. Census Bureau started giving um, people of uh, Hispanic descent, (laughs) I forget how they're phrasing it all the time, you know, Hispanic, Latino, they gave them the option to choose their race, right? It wasn't something that was afforded to others. And part of the reason that this was done was to maintain, uh, if not the fact of a majority white country, at least the uh, uh, image of a plurality of a white country that make the numbers look bigger than they are. Because what was going on amongst Latinos or, or Hispan- Latinos, Hispanics, forgive me, uh, but um, was that four-fifths of them, when given the choice, were identifying as white, which would pad those numbers. And it gets, Alan's article gets into much more than that. It goes over the history of it. But people might be interested in looking at that. But going on, um, regarding um, people, yes, Harrison he had he made money for about four years regularly in the post office. Then he was, you know, just speaking and selling books and very uh, erratic sums of money until he works for the Negro world for a couple of years and he's got a steady income. And then when he leaves that, he uh, works for the Board of Education for four years as I believe their first regular black uh, educator, liter- uh, I mean, lecturer on their series. And uh, those are the main three occupations that he has in his life. And the rest of the time, he's generally speaking and uh, on street corners or indoor forums and selling books. And uh, occasionally he'll pick up odd and end jobs, but he basically lives in poverty. Uh, and he refused money, not only the large sum when he had the voice, but I think you probably remember I, I mentioned when the Communist Party wanted to give him some money and he didn't want to be the stalking horse against Garvey. Um, regarding people today, um, well, I, I, right away I would think of, but he's of course gone, is Malcolm. I think Malcolm had uh, similar principles along those lines. But um, 
re- regarding Reverend Barber, I, I, I'm very impressed by much of the work he does. And you'll be pleased to know that when Volume 1 came out, uh, a friend of Reverend Barber's wrote to me and wanted a book to give to Reverend Barber of Harrison Volume 1. So he's uh, at least had the po- potential of getting exposed to some Hubert Harrison. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ali, for your question. Henry from Chicago. You're... Teresa, how's it going? Okay. How's by you? Uh, cold. <laughs> and, uh, gritty, <laughs> no kidding. And Dr. Chicago, cold. <laughs> they go together. Yes, indeed. Greetings, Dr. Perry. How you doing? <laughs> Hello. All right. All right. Uh, two, two quick questions. Um, one, uh, you mentioned on Monday about a deal uh, uh, to get the book. Uh, is that deal still uh, still alive? And two, um, were there a was there a like a surveillance files, government surveillance files of uh, Hubert Harrison, like some of the other uh, uh, radicals uh, of his time? And that's it. Um, yes. Uh, let, let me answer both your questions first. The, both Harrison volumes can be obtained from Columbia University Press online. If you go to their website, Columbia University Press, and you use the code CUP20, which stands for Columbia University Press 20, you can get a 20% discount. And that's probably the best way to get it right now. And 20% is not bad, all things considered. And, um, Regarding your second question, I had an answer for it, but just what was it? <laughs> I'm getting old. Uh, what was that second question? Was there a uh, surveillance file, uh, oh, like yes, a government yes, surveillance yes. file? Uh, very against, extens- uh, uh, very extensive files by the Bureau of Intelligence, which was the precursor to the FBI, by the military intelligence, who was doing a lot of work. Um, in the U.S., and also by British military intelligence, who was still involved in what was going on in the U.S. And then I was able to get some of his postal records and things like that. Uh, so uh, the government files, there there are many, and they were very helpful, and they're cited throughout both volumes uh, with caution, you know, because you can't trust what they're saying all the time. But they, they particularly uh, were very involved in the period in the 20s around um, Harrison's in- involvement with Garvey and the Garvey trial and things like that. And, but not only Harrison, a lot of other radicals were being um, uh, monitored, like Garvey, like Cyril Briggs, uh, like Randolph and Domingo. And I was able to get, over the years, uh, files, oftentimes redacted, but on, on all these individuals and organizations and things like that, and it was helpful, and you have to sometimes piece things together a little bit, what was really going on. But again, there, the, all these things, not all, but what I, what I use in the book is cited in these notes, particularly in Volume 2, where much of the material is linked to online. So if you're reading a book, uh, if you're if Harrison's doing a book review, you can read his review oftentimes, as well as the book that he's reviewing. If he's making comments in his diary about how he reshapes the Negro world, or his his inner thoughts on Garvey, or um, what he thinks about what's the direction forward for the uh, Negro masses, it's in there. You can look at it. You can read it in his handwriting, which is very legible. And, uh, you know, you can just flip pages. And uh, that material, you can get the links from my book. Or if you go to Columbia University Rare Book Manuscript Library Digital Archives, they have the Hubert H. Harrison papers. So I hope listeners hear that and they take advantage of it. It's all free, but links for that is also on my webpage. So if people go to my webpage, they search around enough, they'll find links to all these things. And the webpage is jeffreybperry.net. Thank you, Eutrice. You're welcome. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Henry, for your question. Uh, as we close out today, Jeff, yeah. what are your thoughts about the need today? Is there a need 
for a Hubert Harrison. Yes, I, I would think so, although Harrison was wary of just one individual, you know, uh, being the, you know, the leader. And not, not totally opposed to it, but, uh, you know, his experience is what he saw during his lifetime. He would hold any such leader to very high standards. But Harrison had the political integrity and the intellectual integrity that I think is needed. He, he would call things for what they were. And, uh, and he was prolific and he was tireless. And that's why I think if people get a chance to read these books, get these books in their public or university libraries and let others read him, they will have much to draw from as we move forward in struggle. They might go through and find, oh, look what Harrison said. Yeah, that's really on the mark. This is insightful. Things like that. And uh, part of why I wrote these books the way I did, again, I've said this before, but it's to let Harrison speak to audiences today because he has so much to say and so much to offer. And his contemporaries acknowledged what, what a real giant he was intellectually and politically and the eulogies at his funeral and before then uh, speak to this as well as when he's alive and delivering lectures people are just uh, swept away with his breadth of knowledge on all top all sorts of topics and so yeah there's definitely need there's needs for many Harrisons <laughs> but I think it, it would be also be good if somehow people can come together in some organization or organizations which keep in mind what Harrison uh, was stressing, uh, the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy as we push, and also the, you know, the importance of the class issues in all these struggles and the international dimension opposing white supremacy internationally and linking up, particularly with peoples of color worldwide. Is there a third book in the works? Well, um, I was actually, I've been actually recently asked by Oxford University Press uh, to put together a Harrison uh, collection, more of a reader type thing for use in colleges. And uh, I had started on that before uh, I had to start doing some promo. This book finally got finalized and we're supposed to get back to it in March and I'll try and finish it up that month so it can come out uh, later this year as well as uh, Verso wants to do a new two-volume, uh, well, they want to do Alan's two-volume edition on the invention of the white race in one volume, and they want me to finish that up within the next few months, too, which I will do, which means I'll just have to do new introduction, and I've got some errata in both in, both in the case of the uh, Alan books. So I've got still a lot on my plate ahead of me, but um, got to just stay healthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and my sincerest hope that you do just that, you accomplish that. Stay healthy. That's the number one imperative here. Uh, the people like you who help to retrieve the missing pages of our history, uh, that you stay healthy and uh, so that you can continue to work you to death. <laughs> you, you, well, that's what Harrison Harrison did work himself. You know, some people commented he worked himself to death. I, I try and rest every now and then. But I, yesterday I was. Uh, we didn't mention this to the audience. But what, the reason I couldn't be here yesterday is I had a full day of scans and all these things at a hospital in New York. But within two hours, my doctor, wonderful doctor, wrote back and said the scans came, no change, which is good. When you get no change, that's a good sign. And so she she put a big exclamation mark. And that, you know, made me feel good for the rest of the day. Well, thanks for being with us today and uh, availing yourself for even more questions. And tomorrow, it's the great trip home. Thanks so much. Looking forward to talking with you again tomorrow. Thanks so much. And we'll get together again tomorrow with Jeffrey Perry and your questions. See you. See you then. Thank you, Eutrice.